sweet, sweet lips, your perfect nose, your rosy cheeks, your ten little toes, your precious little pee-pee, your wondrous eyes, your tender bottom, your pink chubby thighs. We've waited so long for you to come. I'm your dad. Welcome to Beppy Presents. Birth and Early Parenting Educators is an alliance of professionals interested in and focused on the first period of human development from conception to birth and breastfeeding. This is a dramatically important aspect of human development, perhaps the most important time for human beings in their development. And this is because we've learned recently that the baby in the womb is extraordinarily sensitive and vulnerable and open and communicative as we were never able to know before. And we want to get the message of, the, of, this new, of these new discoveries out to parents so they can benefit from them as soon as possible. This program you're about to see is one in a series of programs that we've prepared for you, which we hope will be very fascinating and illuminates this period of human development. You're perfectly, perfect. You've got to jump off cliffs all the time and build your wings on the way down. <laughs> <laughs> sure, Ray. <laughs> One of the things I will talk about tonight is birth and the impacts of birth on life, all, kind of, all kinds of aspects of life. How many of you have given birth to a baby? How many women have given birth to a baby? Just raise your hand and keep them up for one. A lot of babies. How many of you have grandchildren? Okay, how many, of them, how many of you men here fathered a child? Certainly you must know that there's a very profound and intimate relationship between trauma and ecstasy. Surely you might know that trauma in the body is a very dense energy throughout every single aspect of your body and soul. It's a very dense energy. <clears throat> So, for example, if you're carrying unresolved birth trauma or cranial trauma, the viscosity of your cerebral spinal fluid is greater, it's thicker. Your lymph is thicker. Your tissues are thicker. More tension in your tissues. Every aspect of your body will reflect that density. One of the problems with that, if you're a spiritually oriented person, if you hope to make spiritual progress, if you hope to find a connection to God, is that your own embodied spirit is, and your own soul is the most the finest energy in the universe. So what's actually true is that as you're carrying unresolved trauma, then your access to experiencing your embodied soul, actually, probably feeling it, knowing it, sensing it, is greatly diminished. <clears throat> and not only that, the soul has um, a language. 
the language of the soul is imagery. And what happens, uh, the, the hundreds of cases that, that verify this, that if you have unresolved trauma, then the soul is like a powerful, the most powerful television or radio beacon. It's always emanating signals and images to help you discover and claim who you truly are. The problem is that the uh, shock distorts the imagery. It distorts it in a negative way, in a dark way. It distorts it in the direction of your wounding. What happens is that the parents become secure in their connection with their newborn baby. They begin to actually trust that their baby knows and has information, that their baby is wise, and they can give them information about their own process. So, for example, I'm talking about now, and I won't name it later, but now I'm into it. Um, what happened in, for example, one case is that <clears throat> all of a sudden, uh, the mother was doing fine. She had gone to her center, uh, got to the hospital, and was progressing fine. All of a sudden, the fetal monitor went kind of crazy. And they were getting all upset and feel, feel distress went on and on. So the mother closed her eyes and put a question mark on her inner screen. That, that meant to the baby, what's going on? And she just waited. The baby also has a, a screen that's inside the mother. Usually, usually the mother put, put them under their, they carry them under the rib cage or into the heart or in the chest. Anyway, um, the baby sent an image back and it was the face of a sheep. It was smiling. The mother said, there's no fetal distress. Forget it. The monitor The other thing you need to know is that it's not only trauma that needs to be resolved in the body, it's also ecstasy. Any intense experience needs to be processed and brought, in, and brought into consciousness. Some people, I've treated children for spiritual disorders that's had really intense encounters for, with the other side, with angels and things, and they're so, because their family is so rigid or religious or whatever, for whatever reason, they can't tell their parents, and they're so connected to the other side that they don't really need their parents to understand them because these other entities do. So, I work with kids who have prenatal ecstasy that needs to be treated. Okay. Birth ecstasy. Babies experience orgasms during birth. Mothers experience it. Hanna Mae Gaskin, in one sample, found that 20% of mothers reported that in at least one of the births they had an orgasm or more. If a mother has an orgasm, guess who else is having an orgasm? <laughs> Yeah, what a wonderful initiation into the world. Yeah. Body feelings, body memories of what or what a female or a gas feels can feel like. So we need to talk about birth trauma, but it, it be realistic about it. We need to talk about birth ecstasy, and be realistic about it. If you're gonna have ecstasy in life, birth is a good bet. It's a miracle, it's a miracle of life. And one of the things that's problematic, choir, are you listening? Yes. Choir, okay. One of the things problematic about hospitals is that there's no word spirituality written anywhere in the bylaws or the corporation laws. You know, um, we've given up. We've given up the most natural place to give birth. I want to tell you about a study that, uh, uh, published in the Journal of Social Psychology in 1958 by a medical anthropologist, Marcel Gébert. In 1958, this is published. She went to Uganda for the World Health Organization to test babies for intelligence, newborn babies. She expected that, like, like in other countries uh, that are very poor, um, no prenatal visits, no, no doctors before birth, very poor prenatal nutrition and so forth, she expected to find babies with low intelligence. Much to her surprise, she found that babies, the average IQ scores of babies in Uganda were 10 IQ points higher than in Western civilized countries. Well, she was a medical anthropologist, and she looked at all of the reasons why. The only, you know, she's trained to observe scientifically. The only thing she could find to explain it was that all the babies in Uganda were born at home, born in the fields, or in a cab, or in a taxi, or wherever they're dead, or wherever they happen to be at the time of birth. No fear was around. 
no fears around them. They have a culture of birthing. They have birth attendants who've had hundreds of years of uh, heritage. So mothers, there's no fear about birth. Right. And um, then France did a great favor. France came in and built new modern high-tech hospitals so that women could give birth safely. Of course, they were really exporting their technology and, you know, and they're helping their economy. But <clears throat> so now she had a real opportunity to see and do some more observation. So um, she actually, some of the mothers from the, that same community went to the hospital to give birth because they told it would make it safer. And it was also kind of prestigious. I'm going to the hospital. I'm going to be born by, be helped by a doctor. And some women chose to stay at home. So uh, what happened after the birth, she tested the babies, and, and the babies who were born at home had 10 IQ points higher than the babies born in the hospital. On top of that, she did cortisol testing and found that the vast majority, over 90% of the cortisol levels in the hospital babies were abnormal for up to four years after birth, abnormal, at which time they stopped testing, and the cortisol levels of almost all the babies born at home were normal. What's, what's one of the last things you'd want to put in your car, like in your gas tank? Like, how about sand? Water, sand, mud. You really make engine dysfunction, and in fact, the car might run, but it'd be a tough go. And the sand would grind down the engine quite rapidly. The engine would probably last only two years, three years. So it's about what cortisol, abnormal cortisol levels. Cortisol is absolutely essential for health. As well. But if it's at abnormal levels, <clears throat> especially if it's at low levels, or even if it's high levels, <clears throat> let's see here. Cortisol's natural impact on the body is to slow down inflammation, slows down metabolism, slows down growth, physical and mental, and it slows down the immune system. There are, there are chronically high levels of cortisol are associated with infections, allergies, cancer, lupus, Cardiovascular problems, adult onset diabetes, osteoporosis, metabolic disorders, hyperglycemia, hypertension, and muscular weakness. Uh, the effect of metab uh, cortisol on metabolism and immunity are so strong that it explains why infants with very high levels can in fact die. Cortisol damages the nervous system, reduces the size of the hippocampus, causes frontal lesions, brain parcellation, and gives dendrite branching, branching. In other words, the nervous system can't grow optimally efficiently, which is why the, the, the non-cortisol kids have 10 IQ points higher. <clears throat> it inhibits learning, development, IQ. Uh, I, I'm just running through. First of all, I noticed when I started treating babies that there was a certain time, maybe after six sessions or seven sessions, where they would actually encounter their births and cry, cry some of the feelings out that what would happen is that the perineum would, a couple of times I heard, heard, I heard a pop, but there was vast changes in structure, so I actually had a osteopath follow up a couple of kids who was amazed, and I said, my God, these craniums are normalized. So I, did, I discovered a principle that I think has been discovered before I discovered it, but the principle is that whatever postures in your body that exists at the time of a trauma, those postures will fixate and stay in your body until the trauma is resolved. Now by postures I mean gross motor postures. Of course, if you're in this posture and you have a trauma, you're not going to walk around in life like this. So what I mean, what, what I mean when I say the postures persist? Well, the right shoulder will be a little higher, there'll be some torsion in your scapula, in other words, those postural memories that remain in your body. There's some practical significance here because <laughs> Babies' heads, when they come out and go through the maternal pelvis, they take, all babies' heads take the shape of their mother's pelvis because that's how they get through. So all babies' heads are molded after birth. We all agree with that? Yes. Good. Okay, we say big. And if there's no trauma, you'll see in the first in the hours or days and sometimes a week or so after birth, you see Baby's heads will be changing shape. Parents will go, wow, it's the shape where his head is working, folded up before, and now it's Latin. So there's a normalization. But babies where this birth trauma, their creams will remain in that cranial posture forever until the trauma is resolved. So that was an astounding discovery. And I, then I discovered something else. 
I noticed that I was in India and I walked the, I walked the villages and we in the poor areas where they all gave birth in their in their villages, not in institutions. I was amazed at the number of babies with flat foreheads. And what I mean by a flat forehead is that the forehead maintains the perpendicular posture of the body. It doesn't slope back like this. It doesn't curve back like this. And I thought, oh my god, I wonder if that's a natural shape of the cranium. So when I began, I found some research and some books published where they take taken x-rays of, of unborn babies. Uh, back in Greenwell, Green, I'm getting old, Green something or other, <laughs> embryologist. And, and I found out that the, the babies pictures and, and uh, x-rays, the baby's foreheads were all flat. Oh my god, I think I just discovered something. The natural shape of the human cranium is a flat forehead, meaning it's quite perpendicular to the ground. It might have some little curvature at the top. Well, okay, so then I realized, well, okay then, hmm, cesarean babies should have flat foreheads because, because it never, never, conjunct, never went to the pelvis. Cesarean babies do. What, if you don't find flat foreheads, you find foreheads that are curved. And <clears throat> if foreheads curved in any way, or has ridges, most of the time that's because the baby went, face went over the sacrum. And the sacrum is curved. So any time in that second stage of clinical labor, when the mother's pushing, if there's any trauma in there, then the forehead will remain in the curved shape. So guess what? You can start on the bus in school, you can start diagnosing unresolved birth trauma by looking at your forehead and people's foreheads. Here's 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 the deal. The baby's born by cesarean section, <clears throat> flat forehead. Baby's born fat, fat, uh, face down and comes against the sacrum that is quite fast, flat forehead. No trauma, flat forehead. Um, <clears throat> here's the next one. The baby's born face up. It's called posterior birth. It can't have any roundness or shaping because it doesn't go over the sacrum, which is a curved bone. It, it goes over the pubic symphysis, which is a ridge bone. And <clears throat> so you'll have a relatively flat forehead. So you can start diagnosing like crazy. <laughs> start charging money for it. <laughs> so you can have a little booth for lemonade on the street corner, you know, or in front of the hospital, in front of clinics. So, yeah, yeah, you've got birth now. Yeah, you've got birth now. <laughs> now, there's probably some exceptions. And it, can, it can be quite um, complex. Issue, but I'll, I'll tell you another posture. Are you going to do some self diagnosis tonight? You know, when a mother's, when a woman's pregnant, it's going to be popular, man. Drinking beer? <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> what do you want? That's backpack down there. Who knows what? When we were pregnant, they walked like this, right? Am I doing a good job? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. That's because I feel pregnant. I'm <laughs> too. Well, what happens is the baby, babies lie on the, on the mother's spine, on their side. Okay? Babies lie on their side, along the mother's spine, during the last, usually, three weeks or month of pregnancy. Okay. So, if they're lying on their side, they're going to have a curvature in one, on the side they're lying on. It's called the lying side. Chiropractors tell me, people who teach chiropractors say, the most common subluxation pattern in this culture is a low shoulder and a high hip on one side of the body, and we can't treat it. We have to over and over and over again. Guess what? That's because sometime in the last month or three weeks of pregnancy, something happened that was traumatic, and that posture fixing. Again, the principle is any trauma present in the baby or in the mother, when trauma happens, will fixate until that issue is dealt with in the process. So now you can go home tonight. Look off the shirt, look in the mirror, and go, ah, I'm going to have a soul The practical, there's some serious practical value of having this information. Because, for example, if um, David works a lot with hypnosis and has a very powerful, really powerful way of working with, with, uh, with birth trauma, and it can be augmented by 
what's called postural treatment. And that means that once you discover in your own body a particular posture as a result, it could be a cranial posture, it could be a somatic body posture like the life cycle. If you put an adult and you put him in that posture and you have him exaggerate that posture in almost no time at all, um, birth memories will start coming up. So it's actually a technique for uncovering birth trauma. It's particularly useful for people who are highly defended, highly disbelieving, uh, really with good strong defenses or who are, who are dissociated or for whatever reason need a more direct approach. So it's, it's a technique that can be used by itself or otherwise. If you want to do another kind of self-diagnosis, do you want to hear one more? Because I don't have yes. to do this, yeah? How many of you do you want to hear one more way to diagnose yourself? <laughs> okay. You should really be doing it with yourself unless you have training and certification. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, but you can, I'm going to tell you what to do about it. First of all, you can't see my feet, but these are my feet on the ground right now. This is called eversion. One foot's out, like you're more than another. Okay, if you just stand up, before, before the break tonight, before we take a break tonight, I'll have everybody stand up, and I'll just have you stand like what you think is normally. Now have you looked down at your feet, and what you'll usually find out is that the foot that is everted more is the uh, your lie side, because your lie side, you rotate towards the, the, the side you're, you're lying on. I'm on the right side of the lie, so I got out of the like, and if I'm face down, I can turn to the right. So that foot eversion is another, but by itself, foot eversion doesn't say there's unresolved birth trauma. It could be from a physical injury, a sprain as a child, bone degeneration, all kinds of other things. That can be. So, unborn babies are very wise and conscious and aware and communicating, but they're also very vulnerable. They don't have, they do not have the sophisticated psychological defenses that we do as adults. They can split, they can split off, which is a primitive kind of dissociation. <clears throat> they can leave their bodies. The spirits can leave their bodies and they watch the whole thing on top. But <clears throat> having said that, babies are more vulnerable to trauma. And usually, generally speaking, if something is stressful for the parent, it's mildly traumatic for a baby. If something's really stressful or traumatic for parents, and babies are even more traumatized than the parents because they're so vulnerable. <clears throat> and there's a very, I want to add a very positive element here that there's a way through this dilemma. Something that parents can do during and after or any time with their kids. To answer your question, accidents, injuries, illnesses and surgeries in the family, domestic violence, family violence, argumentations, death in the family, physical health problems in the family, Moving house at the last minute. <clears throat> Firstborn children are often traumatized because both parents are working to save money because it's their first child and they have to find a home and they have to make more money and there's a lot of general stress and that translates into potential trauma for an unborn baby unless you do something about it. Babies have kind of inadvertent and they have traumas of their own that have nothing to do with parents or the, the Malu. There's a very interesting relationship between prenatal stress and birth complications. The more stress in the prenatal period, the more, doesn't mean that the birth complications are going to happen, but the more stress there is in the prenatal period, it increases the chances of birth complications and interventions and making birth much more difficult. So things like moving house, finding new jobs, um, having to get married, having dissension, doubt about that, being left by your partner during the pregnancy or shortly after birth, things like that. One baby who was um, an abortion, a sur one baby who's an abortion survivor whose twin was aborted in the second trimester repeatedly was uh, looping around and uh, there's a lot of toxic bad feelings coming through the uh, birth canal. So this baby actually would squeeze the birth the, the umbilical cord, slow down the cigarette smoke and the alcohol or the grief coming in, and uh, also began to loop the cord and got the cord kind of knotted up. <clears throat> and um, so what was causing the trauma for that baby in, into the second trimester was caused by a repetition of what happened in the, beginning, in the beginning of the abortion attempt. So 
the big strong relationship between earlier traumas and later traumas in the womb or during birth. You've got to jump off cliffs all the time and build your wings on the way down. You remember that? Could it be that Ray has some trauma in stage prenatal stage called the fall? The fall is when the conceptus come down, conceptus comes down the fallopian tube and is on the edge and precipice of falling into the uterine cavity, which is a little bit like standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon, recognizing that you're going to uh, fall in. But babies prenates have different styles. Some prenates jump in. Enjoy it. Some fall in. Some feel like they're pushed in. And there is substance called mother's milk. It's not really milk, but it's a substance in the uh, loping tubes that more or less create a flow of liquid that kind of encourages this movement downwards and so forth. Just some resist. Mm -hmm. It could be that Ray has an ecstasy. Ray Bradbury has some ecstasy he has a process. I've known people who weren't suicidal, but they had repetitive thoughts of jumping off of buildings or cliffs, or even some ecstatic experiences, sometimes on LSD, but sometimes not at all, of standing over this canyon in the moonlight, with trees down below, and having the absolute belief they could jump and that nothing, would, nothing, no harm would come. That was their experience. Could it be that they have unresolved ecstasy in a stage called the fall? Just a, 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 we call it the fall because most people feel falling whether they jump in or dig their heels in and feel their shove, there's still that process. Could that be? Yes, of course it could. Some other thing, you know, the prenatal period and, and birth affect life cosmically as well. And they, they affect the chronology of things. For example, if you have a bad first trimester, a good second trimester, a bad third trimester, and a, a good uh, fourth trimester, like after birth, you'll tend to live your life in those patterns. Good, bad, good, bad. And, and, and things will kind of ex experience that way or your original life. So that's, that's a chronology. And could it be that our week was designed by our embryological experience from conception to implantation? Because if a fetus doesn't reach an implant within seven days, it will die. Could it be? Could it be? There are many patterns of relationship that emanate from the prenatal period of time. Could it be that a person's spirituality is augmented by the fact <clears throat> that their mother's <clears throat> favorite brother died during gestation and that, that prenate had left the body and went to spirit to survive and not experience anything negative <clears throat> and came back in the body when the mother finished with her grief like six months later? Could it be? Of course it could be. Trauma can be a gift. Not always bad. Sometimes what trauma creates is pretty, very positive, like that, for example. It's not so much where birth happens as how birth is conducted. If birth is conducted with um, a knowledge that babies are conscious, and can be asked for information. Okay, this is a case I worked with. Mother, again, was, um, labor was going fine. Contractions are consistent, strong, no problems. At a certain point, in the second clinical state of labor, the mother was pushing, at a certain point, the baby was not descending anymore. It wasn't budging, it wasn't moving. The nurses thought, probably this is probably the dystocia, the soldier, the soldier, <laughs> the shoulder, <laughs> caught on the uh, pubic synthesis or the base of the spine. Or something like that. Yeah. So, they weren't sure how to proceed. And then fetal distress started happening. Some pericardial, I mean, heart rhythm patterns started shifting and changing. So it was emerging in towards looking to be emergency cesarean. So um, what happened was this mother had been doing prenatal bonding and speaking in imagery with her unborn baby. I was supervising that process. So she asked the baby, question, how are you, question mark. The question mark meant, how are you? The um, picture that came back from the baby was of a, of a, a cow pulling a cart going downhill. 
and in the back of the car was a little calf, and its head was jammed between two slats, and, and turned sideways. He couldn't get his head back out. So the mother said, oh my God, I've got to get up right. She says, give me a slant board. So we don't have any slant boards in the hospital. They didn't have an old hospital bed. You could crank up the thing. So anyway, they got her on that, on her back, upside down, feet cut off in the air. And then she started breathing and relaxing. And after about 10 minutes, she felt this boom. And the baby, had, you know, literally, the, the baby cat had, had gone uphill. And came, the slats got released. The head got released. And um, within, the baby was born within like 20 minutes after that normal. So babies have knowledge and wisdom. And they can communicate that by imagery. So what we actually need, and I've begun doing, is to, uh, first of all, research Mother, the mother duels and how, how profoundly important that is, how that can change childhood. Order Marshall Klaus's film. It's, oh, it's just a beautiful film. Can't say enough about it. You'll, it speaks for itself. And we need to, to train baby duels. So that somebody is at the birth who's willing to be constantly connected with the unborn baby. Because mothers are busy during birth. A baby doula will work with a mother and her unborn baby before birth in this communication process of sharing imagery. So by the time the birth is going on, there's somebody advocating for the baby. And giving the birth attendants and the mother information about how the baby's really doing and what the baby needs. Mama, get upside down, the baby would say. Mama, turn on your right side. Change your posture. Get on all fours. Please, it's pressure on my back's too much. It's hurting me. When my son was born, and they were busy uh, stitching her back up. She had a cesarean because he had a, his head circumference was 90, at the 99.9 percentile. He had a really big head. He grew into it, thank God. But I said, um, hey, little guy of Jamie. And so before all the medical people get their hands on him, I just said, excuse me, pick him up. And we took off down the hallway. <laughs> and the level of contact that we had, regardless of the six nurses that were like ducks chasing him, <laughs> Can't do that. Can't go there. Bring him back. <laughs> so I had to go to the men's bathroom to get rid of the nurse. <laughs> so Jimmy and I have a special relationship with bathrooms. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for your fathers. There, there are um, in this process. It's called uh, in Europe. It's called bonding analysis, where the mother and baby are. Training, which is the fathers participate as much as they can, especially in the late second trimester throughout the third. And yeah, fathers uh, are essential. They're not just helpful, absolutely essential. I bonded with my baby as deeply as my wife bonded with my baby. And that bonding is so solid, it brings me to tears sometimes. Really, it just it takes my breath away sometimes. It's just how. I'm actually struggling with something in my life. It's unbelievable that he, my son, had such unconditional love. And I had recently, I've had to say no to him for, for something I really wanted to give him. And so I just said no. And I've been getting back this immense amount of love. I'm having to, to actually take in unconditional love. And it's not as easy as you might think. <laughs> I mean, it really kind of cracks, cracks my heart open. My heart's been kind of aching lately because... Your son is 20. He's 23. Oh, mm -hmm. He's a beautiful soul. <laughs> One of the things that happens is, I'm going to name this, there's different kinds of bonding. One kind of bonding occurs long before birth. occurs actually long before conception. Mm -hmm. When a mother and a father, or both, anticipate that there's a baby that wants to come in. And what happens at that level, that's a level of bonding that is critical, because what's true is, that's called bonding, this is very Buddhist, this is called bonding at the level of being, in a being-to-being -being relationship. In other words, if you apprehend the baby coming in, and you celebrate just the fact there's life there, you're loving your unborn, your unconceived baby just because they are, just because they exist. They're not doing anything. Not performing tricks, learning to talk, nothing. Can you imagine having a life like that where you knew for sure 
that you were loved just because you existed. Well, my son had that. I get to live with somebody who actually had that. I know he had it. And that happens to be, I think, the more important. You come to the conclusion that if you bond at that level, you can do preconception bonding. There isn't a whole lot of things in life that's going to really touch you or traumatize you. Because you are so secure in that. So, just wishing that for your grandchildren. Before your, grand, before your children get pregnant and give birth, you can do that work. Put your own private time in your own life. Young people these days, are, their lives are so stressed and they're so busy and there's so many challenges on, on them to make money to thrive and so forth. So how can they even have the time or the inclination to do this kind of bonding? And one answer is, well, it can be the grandmother or an aunt or an uncle or somebody, favorite person in the community. It's, there's, there's more hope. It takes a village to conceive a child. So, somehow getting back to, just naming it, we need to get back to that, even that level. But the main point here is bonding starts at, before conception. And it happens when the mother, for maybe only five minutes, says, oh, I just feel this baby's floating around here. That's, that's bonding. Very helpful. The most important things you can do is first be aware of what Helen is just sharing. Talk openly with mothers who are pregnant. But for the parents, like Claire mentioned, there's a lot of parents who just have a lot of stress in their lives. One of the most important things to have happen is what's called differentiation. If the mother and father are really stressed or arguing or worried or having to buy a house and want to get an abortion or thinking about it, the most important thing is, is that they say that to the child, say, this is me, I'm really scared about having a baby right now, I'm thinking about having an abortion, I feel guilty about that, I'm, I mean, I, maybe this is the time for me to have a baby, but that's me, and I'm, I'm working on that. How are you feeling about that baby? And then, let, have the mother and father just sit and into it, or get a sense of what the baby might be thinking or saying back, but open up that communication process, because it's true, is that the parents don't name it, then it tends to permeate. So you want to have parents be as honest with, with and reminding parents, don't feel guilty. This is just your life circumstance. Your baby's chosen to come at this time, so he or she must be built to deal with it. So let's go past guilt and shame. Let's just talk about what's really true about your life and see if we can get any feedback or information from the baby. There's something about stillness that's very important that no matter how busy parents are, how worried they are, whatever their life circumstances, their relational circumstances, their financial circumstances, it's important that a pregnant mother and her partner and the unborn baby find five minutes every day where there's just silence. The phone's are unplugged, the television's turned off, nothing happens in the house, but they sit down together and they invite stillness. Buddhism, it says, is more intelligence and stillness than any other facet of life. More intelligence and stillness. Problems are often solved in the periods of stillness. So, every day spend five to ten minutes, no matter how busy you are, together, with an unborn baby, and after birth with an unborn baby, whatever it takes, save in stillness. And a lot of times stillness happens when the mother's breastfeeding, rocking, walking. You know, stillness can happen in activity. So, remember, empathy and compassion from parents, whether empathy, whether empathy is accurate or not, and compassion towards unborn babies is a way of preventing birth trauma and complications. Asking for babies to be co-partners in the birthing process. Have all mothers who are pregnant right on their forehead. I talk to my baby. Very little flag. I've got a baby on board. Yeah, really important. If you if you've given birth, first of all, if you have if you're a mother and you have unresolved birth trauma, they will 
likely for me into your baby at the time. But that does, that's not the end of the story. Because if you can write your birth story and give it to your child to read, if you can like write and process your birth history and discover your own birth trauma, without saying a word to your child, you're, you're freeing up any permeated trauma that went into to them from you. Uh, cases where um, mothers own birth trauma, as it was resolving, their, their children became more and more asymptomatic without them even having a discussion. So the first thing to do is to know yourself, and know your prenatal history as best you can, work on your birth history, put your story together. You don't have to even do a, go to a therapist. If you have time, just begin to write down dreams that look like birth. And the more you own about your own prenatal life and birth, the more your children will heal, even without speaking a word. No matter what their age. They don't have to agree with you. They, they can think you're kooky. You never have to talk to them about it. I was walking with Mother Teresa, and I was... Um, I wanted to talk to her about um, meditation and prayer and the differences. And she's a little short little thing, and she walks, she's like, I mean, she walks really fast, so I was kind of jogging. <laughs> and I couldn't quite hear her because she was so far down. But um, she said, um, ah, she stopped. She said, no, oh, no, she said, Meditation is wordless prayer. And what that means is that if you care about your children, of course you do, you love your children, and you let yourself pray, but don't use words. Just sit, and whatever prayer means to you. It even means hugging a tree. But if you just let yourself drop into that space, where you're spiritually connected, your intention to heal your child will heal your child. In that stillness is the kind of magic that happens. That's something you can do right now. I've got hundreds of stories of um, children calling their parents up and saying, oh, I had a dream about you last night. I don't know what's going on, but... And they report exactly the content that the mother was that came up in her silent meditation. These things will come up. That's a good thing. So find your stillness. Find your bliss every day. That will help you enjoy it. I chose my parents. They were like really difficult. <laughs> I, the first day I went to my first psychotherapy session, my therapist asked me for an image to describe how it felt being in my family. And boom, I mean, right away, the image of a vacuum came. There was nothing there. There was physical care and, and their the well meaningness, and I, I think they. They didn't see me, but I, I believe they loved me. <clears throat> um, I wouldn't be here doing what I'm doing today without that trauma, that love. So let your wounding speak out through you. Take the risk to do something about it. It's called generativity. Help people who've been wounded like you. Just stop worrying about yourself. And you'll help you. You can, you can heal a lot of it. Rowan was brought for treatment by his parents because they were concerned about his birth trauma. He was stuck in the birth canal for a considerable period of time and was delivered with the use of forceps. Rowan's birth trauma was caused by four major events, the length and intensity of labor, the position he was in prior to active labor, the obstruction of descent, and the use of forceps. 
When labor began, he was lying in a dysfunctional position. Rather than lying perpendicular to the pelvis, which is normal and functional, he was lying lateral to the pelvis. Babies cannot be born in this position, and there are considerable risks as labor progresses. The parents and midwife were anxious about his position, wondering whether he would turn into the correct position. He finally did turn, and labor progressed normally. However, he failed to descend. The mother pushed energetically. Contractions were consistent and strong, but there was no descent. He was stuck. His right shoulder was caught on the maternal pubic bone, the pubic symphysis, and forceps were needed to release the shoulder. While releasing the shoulder, his right collarbone may have been fractured. Rowan was born vaginally after a 16 and one half hour labor, which included four and one half hours of active pushing. Rowan's birth trauma was substantial, and 24 sessions were required to resolve the trauma. This is more than two times the number of sessions that are normally required to resolve birth trauma. Rowan's treatments began at one week of age and terminated at 24 weeks of age. Both parents were present for all sessions. Presenting symptoms were indicative of severe birth trauma. He grunted through the night, slept sporadically, and was fussy during breastfeeding. He cried extensively, often for obscure reasons. He was also tense and defensive about being touched. If he was held firmly or was touched on or around the head and feet, he would squirm, whine, push away, and or cry. Dr. Emerson asked a prominent obstetrician whether forceps delivered babies were any different than babies who were not delivered with forceps. The obstetrician looked at Dr. Emerson askance, as if Dr. Emerson had asked a most ridiculous question. Why should they be any different, the doctor asked. Dr. Emerson replied, Well, aren't you influenced by your own tragic or painful experiences? The obstetrician said that he was indeed influenced by such experiences, but he did not believe that birth was tragic or painful, nor did he believe that babies could remember birth. This is an unspoken but prevailing attitude in Western medicine as well as Western culture, and it is based on a lack of education. There is a considerable body of anecdotal reports as well as scientific studies which indicate that birth is traumatic and that babies do remember their births. A recent book, entitled Babies Remember Birth by Dr. David Chamberlain is informative in this regard. In addition, there are numerous clinical reports that babies delivered by forceps have personality characteristics that are unique and in some cases dysfunctional. They found that adults who were delivered by forceps expressed consistent and similar themes in their psychotherapy sessions consistent and similar themes in their regressions, and consistent and similar personality issues in their lives, all of which were resolved by regression therapy, that is, by going back to their forceps traumas, by reliving the experiences, and by repatterning the experiences. The treatment model for forceps trauma requires that forceps encounters be uncovered, remembered, and emotionally released through a process called catharsis. Catharsis involves the release of primitive and traumatic feelings like fear, terror, anger, rage, grief, and sadness. In addition to catharsis, it is important to establish deep empathic bonds during cathartic release to repattern forceps trauma by reconstructing positive outcomes and to release physical aspects of forceps trauma which are locked in the cranium, neck, and torso. The treatment model uses two basic cathartic techniques, trauma posturing and birth simulating massage. Trauma posturing involves the gentle but progressive holding of infants in their trauma postures that is, the postures which occur during trauma. 
trauma postures are reliable triggers for uncovering trauma. The holding of infants in their trauma postures is only momentary, just enough to allow memories to surface and to become conscious. Birth simulating massage is another important technique and mimics the passage of babies through the birth canal by massage-like stroking and by gentle compression of trauma sites on the body. Birth simulating massage has been found to reliably uncover birth feelings and birth memories in babies. Because the defensive structures of infants are so primitive and unreliable, and because infants are so vulnerable, the therapeutic techniques are progressive and gentle. They allow infants to be in control of the treatment process and to direct all therapeutic efforts. In addition, parents are present at all times in order to provide the necessary safety, empathy, and emotional support for their babies. Trauma posturing and birth simulating massage were both developed in order to treat infants, but they have revolutionized work with children and adults in four major ways. One, they allow traumas in various stages of birth to be systematically uncovered and treated. Two, they access deeper levels of trauma in children and adults than other techniques. Three, they access unconscious material in children and adults that may have been defended against or missed with other approaches. And four, they provide for quicker and more efficient treatment than other techniques and approaches. During initial treatment sessions, extremely gentle stroking patterns were used. The degree of gentleness may not be discernible on video, but extremely gentle pressures were used. In the forthcoming video segment, Dr. Emerson places his hands on Rowan's head and uses no pressure whatsoever. When first touched, Rowan shrieks. His shrieking represents the kind of crying which typically communicates panic. He also makes a crying sound which sounds like ak ak ak. Ak 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 is a crying which typically communicates the terror that is associated with being stuck and being unable to make progress. Shrieking and crying of this nature are typical of severely traumatized babies. <coughs> The final step in resolving birth trauma involves the somatic repatterning of gross motor movements associated with birth trauma. To do this, infants are invited to physically negotiate a simulated birth canal by pushing through their mother's or father's legs. In the forthcoming segment, Rowan negotiates a very tightly simulated birth canal with considerable ease and with little or no emotional agitation. When infants push through simulated birth canals with no emotional reactivity, their birth traumas are resolved. Through the use of somatic repatterning, desensitizing massage, and birth simulating massage, Rowan's traumatic reactivity and traumatic feelings were gradually resolved. 
When infants are freed of birth trauma, they do not exhibit emotional responses to birth simulating massage or any of the other techniques. Rowan's progression with his trauma resolution is apparent in the treatment segment we are currently viewing. It was his 16th treatment session. Finally, when birth is complete, it is important to talk directly to babies, to acknowledge the struggles, pains, fears, and anxieties that they have gone through, including but not limited to being stuck and feeling physical pain, terror, resistance, resentment, confusion, relief, gratitude, and any other feelings that might have been associated with the delivery. When forceps are used, it is important that they be used compassionately and with an awareness of baby's probable experiences. When this is done, the impacts of traumatic events are significantly allayed. Rowan was delivered with the use of forceps. The turmoil, frustration, aggression, rebellion, and fear that are associated with forceps deliveries were released and resolved during the treatment process, so these feelings were no longer available to him. When children are freed from negative feelings and experiences, when children are freed from trauma, then there is nothing negative that needs to be externalized or expressed. Children are free and clear at an internal emotional level. Such was the case with Rowan, as will be seen in the following photographs. It is often said that the eyes are the mirror of the soul, and it is apparent from these pictures just how clear, loving, and beautiful this child is. There is a complete absence of turmoil, fear, and anger in his eyes, and this is to be expected when children are freed from unresolved trauma. Children are internally free, free to discover the depth of their being, free to develop full and loving relationships, and free to discover the depth of their spiritual nature. They have direct access to their joy, their happiness, and their inner uniqueness. This is the birthright of every child. There is no higher priority than attending to this inner agenda in freeing our children and ourselves from the obstructions of trauma. Then and only then are we free to act without encumbrances and to express ourselves from the depths of our being with freedom and with liberty in every action. As Joseph Chilton Pierce has said, Nature has a biological plan for each child, a plan which, if unimpeded, unfolds one's uniqueness and greatness. Unresolved trauma is not a part of nature's biological plan and is a serious impediment to one's uniqueness and one's greatness.